Hi, everybody. Welcome. See everybody's starting to kick in. Welcome in. Hopefully, Chad will be here soon as well. And uh, once everybody's locked and loaded, we're going to go live. Hey, Chad. Hey, Yoni. Hey, again. nice to see you. Nice job, bro. Hey, good to see you too. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so people are kicking in, so we'll give them another moment. But uh, once we kind of settle, we're going to start uh, running this live on Facebook. Okay, cool. so let's get another moment. Where are you, where are you dialing in from? Teaneck, New Jersey. Okay, not so far from me. I'm in Nyack. You by the bridge. What's it called over there? That bridge, Thorough Neck? Uh, Tappanzi Bridge. Tappanzi, sorry, yeah. Nice. Well, now it's called the Cuomo Bridge. Really? Did they change the name? Yeah. What's the name again? The Cuomo Bridge. Uh, uh, Cuomo, this is the, uh, the governor, but I think their father or grandfather used to be another yeah, governor. Yeah, he right? named after his father. Yeah. Uh, so they're like the Kennedys of uh, the state of New York, right? So <clears> to speak. <throat> the new Kennedys. Yeah. Yeah, something thing, like yeah. that. Got it. Okay, people settle in. Let's start the live broadcast. Give us, give us a second. All right, let's set this up. That's another moment. All right, almost there. It's already live on Facebook, even though we're just setting it up. There's a look, usually a little lag. Let's do that. Let me go and light some incense to set the mood a little bit. <laughs> yeah, put some perfume. And uh, yeah, as long as you know your own story, we should be, uh, we should be all right. Okay, so we're live on Facebook. Good. So listen, we're going to send this to post-production, but this is a live recorded event. Uh, uh, later on, it's going to go to post-production with our studio. So I'm going to break it in and I'm going to break it in right now. Three, two, one. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Prime Talk. Today, I'm really excited to have, uh, uh, when I say a special guest, this time, I more than mean it. This is, uh, let me just read you a little bit of the credentials. We're having uh, Chad Rubin. He's the co-founder and CEO of Scubana, which is a cutting edge e-commerce management platform. Plus, he's one of the founders of the Prosper Show, which we are in uh, right now. This is a uh, part of the Prosper uh, virtual show. And he's the author of the book, Cheaper, Easier, Direct, which really touches on how to disrupt the marketplace and create your own e-commerce empire. So, Chad, welcome to the show. Hi, uh, thanks for having me here. A pleasure. Um, today's episode is really going to deal all about you. It's going to be the Chad Rubin story. So you're going to share with us, you know, who, who are you, where you're from, your background, where'd you grow up, where'd you go to school? Uh, how'd you begin your professional career? And without further ado, let's jump right into it. Yeah. So there's a lot there to unpack. So uh, where should we start, Yoni? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born uh, in Queens, New York City. Uh, which part? My, my, my parents, my father owned a vacuum store. Uh, well, which part so, of Queens, if uh, I can ask? I think uh, Rideau Park, Forest Rideau Hills. Park. Got it, yeah. Uh, my parents, my father owned a vacuum store. Uh, my parents were uh, second... For, they, they didn't even go to college, right? So essentially, my and my father on my father's side, they were all in the Holocaust, so they came here with nothing. And so on the Holocaust, pretty, so which uh, Poland or which area? Poland. Got it. Wow. So, so what, you know which year around which the, they came right after the war, or a few years, decades after? Uh, they came actually while the war was happening. So my oh. father's mother uh, was sent on a ship here when she was seven and started working the factory floor in Canada while the rest of her uh, siblings have now are now you know, been, were deceased through the war. Got it. Uh, so they had no education. They worked in a factory. They were entrepreneurs. Uh, my father then was also an entrepreneur and it kind of has run in my family uh, bloodline for quite a period of time. Uh, and that really lends itself into what I've been doing on the Amazon side to make this specific around the Prosper Show on Amazon is that my parents had a vacuum store and I don't know if those that are listening, when was the last time they've ever been to a vacuum store? But I, I took what I knew, what I was raised in, what I was brought up in, and I modernized it. Right? I took it, I made it a real world, world application. And we started, essentially first started reselling product on Amazon. This is by the way, before there was 5 million sellers on Amazon. Yeah, we're talking about like about a decade ago or more, right? Yeah, first generation Amazon seller. I was able to capitalize on that opportunity really quickly. And uh, started making. Well, let's let's, let's backtrack again. Yeah. Just a second. We jumped into the the, let's the do top it. of the game. The top of the game. So, Rigo Park, Queens, born and raised, and then you guys moved or settled or what was the transition? <laughs> yeah, so we moved to New Jersey when I was in third grade. 
Which part? Uh, so we moved to an uh, area called Westfield, New Jersey. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's not too far from Edison, I believe. No, 135 in the parkway. Yeah, I used to live there. So just uh, happened, oh. happened to know. Yeah, my brother used to cool. live there. So I used to live with him uh, when I first came to America, you know, fresh off the boat. But um, yeah, so you grew up in New Jersey, essentially, from that point on, no? Yep, grew up in New Jersey uh, and was living in an area that we probably should have never been living in. My parents were never making ends meet, barely making mortgage payments, but they wanted but they to raise transitioned the store from Queens to New Jersey or they kept it in, yep. in, in the Queens? The store was always in New Jersey. My dad was doing the commute oh, like two it. hours each way every day, which was uh, hard on him. So right, yeah, definitely. Decided... So what was the store in New Jersey? It was in Westfield. Oh, okay, got it. So that's it. You had to I guess married to the business and go right next door where the, the store is. Yep. Made sense. Okay, good. So uh, you finished high school there. What was the transition for you growing up? Yeah, finished high school there. And then I was a first generation college graduate. So I went to UMass. I went to University of Massachusetts, Amherst. And I studied. And what year was that? Which years did you go there? Uh, in 2000. Uh, wait a minute. Let's see. I graduated in 06. I graduated early. Uh, so 2003 to 2006. Got it. 2003, you're off to Boston or area? 2003, I went to um, Amherst. Where was that? Where Amherst, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay, good. So you relocated. You, you you stay there. Oh, you know, you're in uh, essentially in the dorms. Yeah, yeah, for yeah I stayed yeah. in the dorms. Yeah. So detached yeah. from New Jersey, off on your own for three years. Yep. That's where I met my wife, by the way. Oh, nice. So we're nice. college sweethearts. And I graduated early because I was paying my way through college myself. So I wanted to just save every dollar I possibly can. So I stuffed all my Amazing. curriculum into three years versus four years. And uh, I studied finance. So I studied the, the discipline of finance specifically to build an expertise there because I felt like I was lacking in that, I was deficient in that, in that category growing up. And so for me, the dream was to go to Wall Street and get a job somewhere on Wall Street, Got which it. I did. Oh yeah, so 2006, you graduated right into Wall Street. What was the transition? I graduated and I started, uh, I started working on Wall Street. I uh, got a job as a very low level associate on Wall Street covering internet stocks, specifically semiconductors. For which, uh, which institution? Uh, yeah, so initially I started off at a company called uh, Thomas Weisel. It's a mm -hmm. white shoe investment bank. They took Yahoo Public and Semantic Public Nice. And then I jumped over to another company called Friedman Billings Ramsey, uh, did work there and put in time, learned a lot about business, a lot about profit and loss statements and balance sheets and cash flow statements, uh, learned how to model and forecast. And then- So you were working in New York City? <clears throat> in New York City, yeah. Park were you Avenue. living there also? What was, uh, what yep. were you living? Living yeah, on the Upper it. West Side. Uh, and my wife then graduates in 2007. We move in together. And I'm grinding on the street. So I'm working in uh, the, the best times on Wall Street uh, right before the Great Recession. Oh, yeah. 2008. Uh, 2000, yeah, 2008, 2009. I was eventually uh, fired from my job 2009, February, Friday the 13th, 2009. Whole meltdown, yeah. You know, companies or banks like Lehman Brothers, more than 100 years in business, melted down. There's a shockwave throughout the system. And I guess that was part of the, part of the reason we got released. Uh, no, actually I survived three head cuts and I just, me, I, 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 my boss was let go. I went to Israel for, uh, some va a vacation and my boss was fired while I was on vacation, not fired. It was let go. It was a head count, yeah. head count reduction. So I flew back from vacation early to re-interview with a new boss mm -hmm. and me and this boss could not have been polar opposites. And, uh, I always believed in, uh, it's not about picking the company, it's picking who you work for, right? Does that, if that person believes in you and sees growth in you, they're gonna invest in you and want you to grow. I didn't have that dynamic with this specific individual. So he actually just let me go, which is the best thing he could have done. And it opened up a huge door for me to start something new. Yeah, as they say, from the little dips in life, you know, it opens up a brand new track. Yeah, when one door closes, another door opens. Oh yeah, so what happened? What was the next station? Uh, the next station, so I took all my stuff in a brown box and I told <laughs> my father, I told my father about it. He drove into the city. And by the way, just before I was let go, I was actually doing a little moonlighting. I was helping them resell their products on Amazon and eBay. I built them a website on my free time on Volusion. So this is where during your college years or Wall Street years? 
this is during no during my Wall Street years. I was helping my parents on the side, trying to help them stay afloat. I was actually extending them some credit. I was I was really pretty involved in their business, but I was still working this full time job that wasn't it wasn't the rainbow that I thought it would be mm-hmm. that I dreamt it would be when I studied finance. Got it. There 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 wasn't any gold at the end of that rainbow. Yeah, just so, uh, helping them uh, modernize, you know, make ends meet. And maybe have a better, you know, position, uh, you know, in their business, and off you yeah. go. Yeah. So I, I know I'm slowly taking everyone through this journey. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly what we me. want. Yeah, this is exactly what uh, we want. This is the nuance of uh, how you are, you know, in this position that, that you are today. Yeah, and I haven't actually talked about this in a really long time. Like I'm like living through it by by retelling the story of of the event. Exactly that, the that point. Happened. We're throwing you on the couch, and you know, you got to air it out. Yeah. So my father came to pick me up from my job when I was fired. And we pulled up to my apartment. I lived on 78th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus. Uh, and we pull up and there's a school right there. And my father says, uh, see those kids? This is like the most profound thing I think I've, I've got from my father. He said, see those kids? I said, yeah. He's like, they're free and so are you. Mm-hmm. And this opened up a creative opportunity for me to take advantage of what was happening in e-commerce in, in 2009, like it wasn't anything of what it's like now in 2020. And so I was like, okay, you know, I'll help you on the side. I'll, I'll help you a little bit. And then I started helping them and started becoming more and more and more. And so then- you started commuting from the city to New Jersey. That was kind of the dynamic? No, the, the dynamic was uh, my, my father was doing the fulfillment. I was doing more, more or less the marketing and the strategy and the new product design and development. And then my father passes away. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize. So my father passes away. Uh, My father passed away, I believe in 2012. Mm -hmm. So you're already, what, two years working together at that point or or 2000, I got released or two to three years. You're already, uh, you and your father, you know, making this happen. It was this sudden or this was uh, an an illness? Uh, It was uh, pancreatic cancer. So it happened like really quickly Mm -hmm. and um, and by that point, we already were initiating on a direct consumer strategy, but very lightly. And we started going all the way in. So we started manufacturing. And at that point, I was only focused on vacuum products. Hold on. So for, for these three years, uh, you know, you're in e-commerce. Give us a little bit of the breakdown. Was just Amazon, just eBay, both, or your old .com? What was the dynamic there? Well, when we first started, there was no FBA. Right. Uh, so we were FBM. We were on Volusion and eBay simultaneously. Evolution, if, if somebody uh, from the audience uh, in the recording hears this, it's, uh, I'm not sure how popular it is today, but back in the day was to establish your uh, e-commerce store. It was like almost like a Shopify of the, of the old days. Yeah, and they, they recently went bankrupt. So you know, Shopify really put a nail in their coffin uh, and just like, you know, scaled far quicker than, than Volusion could. Right. So, so essentially you have your .com, your eBay, your Amazon, three legs. Yes. So working on those three legs and uh, eBay was still very prominent at the time and Google, people were still doing product searches on Google and, and finding items on Google. And so we were multi-channel from the get-go. Like I've always set up the business to be multi-channel because I, I do believe picking a channel or just, I think, choosing between, between channels doesn't, you don't have to, right? You can be everywhere if you want yeah, to. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's not a zero sum game. It's not like I pick Amazon, I'm not gonna be on eBay. I was like, I just wanna be everywhere People are on the journey. A hundred percent. This is, by the way, the fiduciary duty for any retailer, really. Your mission is, as a retailer, is to move products from A to B. That B can be anywhere. As long as you have a, a comfortable uh, ability to do so, you have to. If something is really, uh, it's going to cost you a billion dollars just to open up a market, maybe you've got to reconsider. But today, with e-commerce, really no excuse. You can really be almost at every uh, e-commerce uh, platform. So uh, that, that's great. But what was the products you guys were selling? Yeah, were you guys were reselling or was your own label or both? No, we, so initially we, we were reselling, we were drop shipping and we moved into our manufacturing our own products. We started with one product and we started in one category, which is vacuum filters, which is near and dear. I was selling vacuums when I was 11 years old like in my father's store, helping out on the weekends and after school. So I knew the vacuum industry really well. And we started there. And I also knew e-commerce really well because actually when I was on Wall Street, I was actually, my last gig, I was covering internet stocks. I was advising hedge funds and institutional investors to buy, sell, or short various stocks in the e-commerce universe, internet universe. Interesting angle. You have the nuance of a niche, right? Vacuum cleaners. 
but the high level, you know, Wall Street, uh, you know, bird's view on, on what's going on. And potential. when you can do that, when you take a specialized expertise and something that you were raised with and combine it with something that you've now committed your career to and mold that together, I think that there's that's an opportunity to 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 uh, to capitalize on. I call it you become lethal, but yeah, lethal. It's a nice it's a nice opportunity. So so let's see. Uh, so we're 2012. You know, your father's passed, and um, what was the next station there? The next station for me was moving into where we started really saturating the vacuum cleaner space, and I kept on looking over my shoulder. I'm like, oh, there's going to be some copycats, like there's gonna be people that are gonna be on my heels that are gonna be taking, like coming and competing. There's not really a barrier to entry here. There's no moat, there's no competitive advantage. Right. And I kept on looking over my shoulder, nothing was there. And I was like, okay, let's move into the next space though. Let's move into the next product because like if Apple came out with the iPhone and never iterated on the iPhone, Android would have surpassed it. Uh, and there wouldn't be an iPhone today. So right. they had to keep moving. They had to keep generating the next new thing, product development, thinking about where the, the vision of the company is going. And we moved into coffee filters, which is the next dearest thing to my heart. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I actually recently quit caffeine, which is kind of insane to think about. But I, I was a very, my identity was wrapped up in coffee and third wave coffee. And I was like, how do I take what I know about filters and make coffee filters with that? And we started doing that. So we moved into coffee. And this is what year? Well, this was already 2012 or? Uh, this was uh, probably 2014, right? We, we saturated the market in the, in, the, in the vacuum space early with vacuum filters and bags. A lot of vacuums started going bagless, so we started making filters instead. Then we moved into hoses and rollers, and then we moved into coffee. And most now, of your revenue was uh, your own brand, or was it uh, like 50 All our own brand. We, we stopped doing any reselling. Wow, so you completely detached reselling, what, around 2014 as well? Probably 2000, uh, 2000, completely detached 100%, probably 13 or 14. Yeah. Amazing. Great, great uh, evolution there. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, a great evolution and much needed, right? Because the rese I knew that there was going to be disruption as a reseller, right? The more points of, of the train that, that happened, like Warby Parker had just occurred and Bonobos just had happened. Like everybody was cutting out the middleman and going direct. There was no need for a reseller in the picture. Yep. I think that once again, that's a bird's view eye that you, uh, Wall Street kind of gave you where you see what uh, things are, the parts are moving and you uh, take action before it's too late or much before anybody else. And uh, you're always kind of a few steps out of the game. I, I wish. I mean, it's, again, it, it looks rosy looking back on it. Now, there's a lot of pitfalls. There's a lot of troughs that had happened in this adventure, right? And so it's not always just glam and glitz. Like, oh, yeah. It's when you hit a wall. Yeah, I, I hit so many walls in this process whether it's fulfillment walls, right? Figuring out fulfillment strategies, whether it's being suspended on Amazon, uh, whether it's getting sued because we were making uh, replacement products to fit manufacturers, vacuum cleaners and coffee makers units. There's so much that went into it that you wouldn't anticipate when you're first coming up with an idea or just being like, hey, there's room for disruption here. There's a problem that needs to be solved. Let's attack it. Got it. Wow. And all this to, uh, you know, uh, uh, until 2014, you experienced all that up to that point? Or I that mean, I was, it, that, that was consistent through my experience. I think business in general is a combination of highs and lows. And you just got to make sure you can hang on for the ride. Got it. Okay, so what transpired in 2014? Uh, what was the next session there? We outsourced my warehouse. Uh, we initially had a warehouse in Harlem. We then moved to Little Ferry. Uh, hold on, hold on. What was it, Harlem? Just uh, seems too random to be true. So what was? Well, well, so I lived in I lived on the Upper West Side. And oh, so okay, got it. First, we were having boxes with a, a lift gate being dropped off in my apartment on the Upper West Side. <laughs> my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, was like, "Hey, Chad, this is not going to happen here. You need to move this somewhere else." So I quickly found a storage unit with no windows on a second floor unit in Harlem, in East Harlem, 121st between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. Uh, that was an experience. Yeah, that's uh, you got a fulfillment center inside New York City. That's how it feels and looks like, you know? That's what it felt and looked like. I was hiring uh, high school laborers to come and do help and pick and pack in Harlem. And I even, on my way to, to the office, I got I got mugged once. Oh my goodness. Uh, which is a interesting. So I had all these experiences I never had before. I had never managed employees before. I never managed a warehouse before. We were growing so quickly that essentially when I first walked into that space, my father-in-law now, who was born on the day my father died. So fascinating. He kind of became a new, a father to me and a mentor and a support wow. for me. 
he was like, oh, this space is not so big. And I was like, no, this space is huge. He's like, I, he's like, don't worry, you'll, you'll fit into it just fine. We fit into it just fine. We drew out of it. So we needed to move to New Jersey to another space in Little Ferry, New Jersey. How quickly did you grow out of it? Within like a couple of months, honestly. A few months. Look at that. All right. So from the Little Ferry across the river, across the Hudson, still not too far. Not, not too far. So I was doing the commute to Little Ferry, managing a team of, say, 20 warehouse people doing pick and pack. And that Yourself. became, I mean, I was helping them, right? Like yeah. if they were, if they didn't show to work, if they were high coming to work, right? I needed to send them home. Uh, I would be sometimes left unloading containers, smoking cigarettes and trying to figure out how I'm going to do this all by myself. Man, you're clutching it. You're clutching all over. Yeah. So a lot of grit. And then finally, uh, we had enough warehouse employee issues where we lost the warehouse manager. We lost, there was a lot of collusion happening and there was a lot of uh, these employees were getting together and uh, went on strike and all tried types to of unionize. They tried to unionize so quickly. Huh? Yeah, they tried to unionize so quickly. And one of them I had fired, he actually had drew, uh, drew some like anti-Semitic things on some boxes in my, in my warehouse. So I fired him and as he left, he called, he stole the key, the key to go up and down with a forklift. And he also called, and he took some other things. He took an iPad and then he called OSHA. What's that? So OSHA is a uh, compliance agency that made sure to protect the safety of warehouse employees or even Got just any, any, any workplace. And so we had OSHA compliance violations everywhere. Like we were not we were growing sort of quickly. There were boxes that were stacked high. There was extension cords that aren't supposed to be where they were. Uh, and they shut down my warehouse. So wow. what does that mean when that happens? That means that only family members can go and pick and pack boxes for you or pick and pack. Uh, Actually do the work. Yeah, get the work done. Instead of yeah. 20 people, you, the only ones you can bring is your immediate family. So it's me my wife, <laughs> my father-in-law, my mother-in-law. Uh, and I was like, okay, this is just not working anymore, right? There has to be a different way. And so it always comes to that crossing point. It's like, anytime you find a problem, that's a wedge into an opportunity. And so we had this problem and I found a warehouse in New Jersey to solve this problem for me. And by, that, by this point, by the way, nobody was doing third-party logistics or 3PLs. Nobody was outsourcing fulfillment and I was afraid. I said to my wife, I said, hey, you know what? This might eat up all of our margin. We might actually not be able to stay in business because of the costs associated with this. Yeah, it was a huge we, X factor for you because it's infant. You know, nobody knows Amazon, FBA, label. What is he talking about? They have no clue, no, no concept in mind, and you have to break it in. Yep. So we actually had employees switch over to work for this company, uh, this fulfillment company, and train them. They only lasted a couple of days because they were very strict about the hours that you work, when you come in, when your lunch break is, it's all driven based on a bell. Right. And that's not what they came from with working at my company. My company was just like- Bootstrap. It was bootstrap. You do what you want. There wasn't a lot of processes in place. Right. So we outsourced this weakness to the fulfillment center and that opened up a world of possibilities and opportunity. That's great. So this is all in 2014, 2015? Yeah, uh, 2000, I think this happened in 2013. 2013, got it. Okay, when you say open up a world of opportunities, what was what was those kind of stations? Well, yeah, well, we, we decided to, by getting rid of the warehouse fulfillment, I wasn't needed to go into a warehouse anymore to pick and pack. So what does that mean? I can now use my efforts on higher impact activities like marketing, new channel generation, new product development, all the things that I was really passionate about that uh, I wasn't able to achieve with a warehouse. Got it, only so you one person. Right. So your focus changed from operation, just surviving into growth. Let's do all the impactful things that, you know, generate tremendous growth and, uh, and more and more opportunities. Uh, and, you know, 2013 until when, when was the, I guess, the next session for you or the, the, uh, the next evolution? So actually what you while did? this was happening, not only was I thinking about the warehouse piece and outsourcing that, but I was thinking about the software piece mm -hmm. and technology. I always knew technology is a competitive advantage. And so while this was happening, I was getting rid of this warehouse or having issues and outsourcing and thinking about the outsourcing of warehouses. I was thinking about how do I run this business in a way that connects to the warehouse where I can automate a lot of low value repetitive tasks. And uh, I was having a hard time finding a software that can handle my order volume because we were, we are doing very high order volumes. 
Uh, and how many units a month, for example? We were doing at the time roughly about 50,000, 60,000 orders a month. All right, and uh, how many SKUs and you had in your uh, catalog? At that time, I don't know the snapshot. I can just tell you now we have about 1,500 roughly, 1,800. SKUs, wow, that's yeah. a lot of variety. Got it, yeah, so variety. it's crucial to have the right system in place for sure. And so we didn't have a system, right? And so I always thought that you need to have, like there was all these like apps that you can kind of stitch together. But if you're using one piece of software for shipping and one piece of software for inventory and one piece of software for analytics, you've got a massive problem on your hands because none of them talk to each other. And there's no common language to give you the intelligence to operate on. So I was like, we need a unified operating system, which was then became Stubana. We started building Stubana out of my own pain and it was incepted or it was born out of my own pain and started in 20, we started building in 2013, 2014. So the first lines of code, 2013, 2014. DJ definitely dropped the first line of code in 2013 and we officially went live in 2015. So you're in the market, live and well, 2015? Well, live, but we had a, we, <laughs> in software, they say you should always do a minimum viable product. Yep, MVP, and, yep. An MVP, and the same thing with the, when you're doing product development too, right? And even in commerce, right, you wanna have an MVP. And I think that we did a massive viable product. There was scope creep that happened. We started expanding the scope of our product offering of what we wanted to achieve with our vision. And, uh, but yeah, so we had a massive viable product in 2015, but still needed a lot more love and massaging to become uh, what Stubana is today. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, I mean, uh, the technology development, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a whole pain. On its own, we can we can discuss that all together. A different, uh, I think we probably share the same uh, few pains as you scale up your uh, your technological infrastructure. Uh, it just takes a while. But you mentioned DJ. You want to give him a shout out to uh, who DJ is? Yeah, shout out to DJ. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of hiring people to, not just hiring people. Like I partnered with DJ. He he had the vision. I just actually initially I just wanted Subana to be an inventory app, right? I was like, mm -hmm. I have an inventory issue. And DJ was like, no, 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 you have more than an inventory issue, right? You have a, a you need an operating system that puts it all together. And so it was DJ to, to give him maximum amount of credit. And what's his full name, DJ what? Uh, DJ Kunovac. Kunovac, got it. To give him the full credit. He said, you need to have order management and inventory together so you can actually properly automate, but also have the intelligence to run the business. You need to have a system. And without the order management piece, you don't have a system. You're just another app in the ecosystem. And that actually is a core tenant and a core competitive advantage that we have today. Amazing. And how did you and DJ come across? What was the evolution there? A friend of mine from college uh, introduced us. He was playing with t tennis with DJ on the tennis court and mentioned I had this problem. We tried to solve it without DJ, just me and Ben. We couldn't solve it. We tried to solve it in India, couldn't solve it. DJ came in, scoped everything out, did the requirements analysis. But what's his background, DJ? Is he a developer? He was working at McKesson, which is a healthcare, uh, one of the biggest healthcare companies in the United States. And he was actually doing this specific task of actually unifying hospital systems, uh, different softwares. Man, you and got lucky, Chad. You got really I got, lucky. I mean, it's a combination of luck. I think that's part of it, right? Being at the right place at the right time, but it's also pursuing that luck. That is that is a big piece of, of life. In general. Yeah, it seems to me that with the, the 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 fact that you outreach, you know, you went to your friends and have this pain point, you know, you share, you go out and outreach, and you know, it, the, this momentum generates itself, and then the kind of the solutions come together, and the best talent and the best skills, <clears throat> and the best opportunities kind of open up without you, you know, you realizing it at the moment. Obviously, looking back, you can probably uh, clearly identify that. So it's brilliant. So that's how you and DJ uh, came together and. Quickly, all the pains that you kind of had, you was able to write into code to alleviate that. But it seems to me, kind of you guys uh, complement each other in terms of the ability to understand the scope of the proposition for the system, uh, you know, going forward. Because you were focused kind of on your pain, but he, has, he had the ability to open up uh, the scope a bit more. Um, so By the way, he was the builder and I was the seller. Like I've always been on the sales marketing side and he's been on the engineering side. And that's the division of work and the division of labor that carries out to today. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit interesting. Just full disclosure, you know, I'm the COO, one of the co-founders of Gitira. Uh, I, at this point, I find myself as, as kind of the face and, you know, putting the sales and marketing. Well, my co-founder, Max, uh, Max Bourne, he's right now really hard on the, you know, tech side and development side and, and, and making make sure that the production and the product itself is, uh, you know, all superior and top of the line. So 
same dynamics uh, I kind of feel. And uh, I think uh, it's an interesting combination that hopefully, I, I think for us, it makes us more lethal. I hope so, I hope so uh, you know, for Scubana to be the same. Oh yeah, for sure. So 2015, you guys launch and uh, take us uh, to next stations. What, uh, what else happened? Uh, well, 2015. I guess let's lay down two tracks, right? Let's down. You got the regular retail. What I assume you're still in today, right? That's kind of yep. two tracks you're riding. Virtual, yep. The second virtual track is Scubana. Scubana. So let's dive into Scubana. Well, we can maybe touch base on the retail side uh, after afterwards. Well, so it was with Scubana that I was able to automate most of those activities. And Crucial now has one employee in the United States, Kristen, and uh, everything else is largely automated with. Stubana on the operation side. So switching gears back to Stubana, we raised money. One of our early investors was James Thompson. Uh, no kidding, from one of the co-founders of the Prosper Show by Boxer. He, yeah, Legend. yes. Him and, and Joe Hansen uh, really were really at the forefront of Prosper. And uh, I invited James. James was my FBA account manager back in the day. Oh, at Amazon, when he was working yep. at Amazon? Got it. Oh, nice. And so we kept in touch, and I shared with him what I was building, and he came in to invest in Stubana, and then I came in to invest in Prosper Show. So, again, it goes down. down it comes down to relationships and keeping those relationships warm over the course of time because you never know where they're going to take you. Absolutely. And and which year did you, you guys create the Prosper Show? Uh, 2000, I want to say, was it 2016? I think so, yeah. I think so. so uh, the first show was at Utah, then in Las Vegas, became a really a sensational success. And then I think a year ago or so, uh, got bought out by Emerald, which is a public company, which uh, they host uh, a variety of trade shows. That's kind of uh, their um, their strength and yes. uh, their their core competency. Uh, so everybody kind of, I guess, did an exit there. Uh, but once again, and, it's and another James track. Is the is the brainchild. He's the mastermind behind Prosper Show. Like I, you know, I, again, I'm all about giving people credit where it's due, and it really was. James' vision that was executed in such an eloquent manner. I, I don't know anybody else that could have done it in the time frame that he did it. And this is to remind everybody, these are people that are running, you know, multi-million dollar uh, organizations uh, for, for their own retail activities, like Chad, plus Chad had, uh, you know, Scubana and uh, James Thompson, once again, ex-Amazon employee, but created a massive agency, uh, to, you know, uh, cutting edge, top of the line. But he says, what else can be done? And what, especially what can, uh, else could be done for this community or for this industry? That's how they conceived the, the trade show of, of Prosper. And I did, I do believe, truly believe that, you know, for thousands of sellers that came over through the years, they're able to do better business because of the structure of this body. Uh, and once again, so it takes that vision and that will and that thrust, uh, you know, so even though you're successful, you know, running, running big organizations, what else can be done? That's that entrepreneurial bug, but also um, creating uh, value for others, which is uh, uh, something to, uh, to admire and uh, pay attention to. Okay, so um, you're also part of uh, Prosper, but you said James and... Uh, and um... Uh, Joe, it was really James, I think. Joe uh, is a big part of BuyBox Experts. They merged companies. And so Prosper was happening. I wrote a book. Amazon was now on the, essentially it was a gold rush into Amazon at the time, right? So timing was also really impeccable. Uh, Stubana obviously has a lot of Amazon centricity built into the platform, even though we are uh, agnostic. Yeah, we're D2C. We initially started off supporting just a lot of Amazon merchants and we've shifted from just supporting Amazon merchants to supporting brands that embrace Amazon as a channel, not just a business. So important. Uh, it's easy to get uh, trapped in saying, "Hey, this is such a, you know, such a, a fueling environment, the Amazon ecosystem, which it, which it truly is." Um, but if somebody is an entrepreneur out there in the e-commerce space game, it's probably uh, best to be advised that really uh, your chances of survival long term is if you really build a, a viable brand for yourself, and that brand is pretty much everywhere in e-commerce. And of course, if you can uh, uh, create arms and legs and brick and mortar, even though today is more challenging than ever before. It's never a bad thing. You never know, you know, where you're going to get to. And once again, the, the fiduciary duty of, uh, you know, anybody in trade or trying to sell products from A to B, you know, reach, reach as many markets as you can. Um, and, and the way to do it best is when you have a brand, when instantly you get recognized, you get preferred, you have a moat, a business moat between, you know, brand A and brand B. And this is kind of what Scubana, I believe, is trying to facilitate on a very, very, you know, large scale for, uh, you know, DTC brands, DTC brands who recognize this opportunity. Yeah, and I do. I want to say that we've migrated from just talking about D to C, direct consumer selling, to actually direct to everywhere. 
So it's not just D2C anymore. What you're seeing is a lot of these digitally native brands that initially were created and grew up just selling direct consumer with a Shopify site are now selling wholesale. There you go. They're selling brick and mortar. They have a pop-up shop. Uh, there's so many different avenues that they're starting to embrace right now. And that's really the the landscape that Stubana plays in pretty heavily. So you guys actually laid the tracks for wholesale as well? And then on the yep. platform? Yep. So, so we have an, just like Shopify, we have an app store and you can click a button and you can integrate to all your EDI providers. Uh, we have four that we support on the platform. You can do everything through the app store. It just allows you to add strength to our platform with a click of a button. That's great. I was not aware. There we go. You guys, once again, that vision, the, once again, it goes back to the core fiduciary duty of a, a retailer or, or somebody in trade, reach everywhere as much as possible. E-commerce space is a great place to start, especially the Amazon. But once again, once you become a brand, a really viable brand, you have a business mode, then b b brick and mortar is definitely a viable opportunity. It's still, at least in, that, in uh, the United States, 85% of the trade. So uh, obviously there's opportunity there. If you guys facilitate that, that's, that's a blessed thing. Okay, so uh, talk, to, talk to us about, uh, I guess, challenges with uh, Scubana. I know over the years, you guys are ready for five, six years. What are the, you know, what was the skill you started you and uh, DJ and where are you guys today in terms of uh, where are you guys located? You know, how many people on the team? You know, so scale, we're, 30, 30, scale 30, we're about 33, 34 people. We uh, ha are now officially remote not just because of COVID, but we're actually going to be remote forward uh, with like hot seats available once people are more comfortable going back into the office. So the office is where, New York City? The office is in, was in New York City. We closed it. Uh, was it was New York on, City in New Jersey? Uh, it was in New York City, 18th between 5th and 6th. Yeah, because yeah, the town called West New York uh, in New Jersey, uh, across the river. I don't know if you know that. Uh, oh, York. yeah, I, I, I do sure. know West New York. No, it's in, actually in the Flatiron District. That's where it was. And now we're fully remote. I mean, we had everybody in New York City. Now there's 10 people left from what I've counted in the metropolitan area. You got it. Oh, so everybody really spread out physically where, where they people live now. People moved, people left, people fled. People are living back with their family. They're, they're, they're running their, their life in a very different way uh, during COVID right now. Got it. But yeah, I'm, I, I, I probably bet that even though this all happened on a physical scale, uh, on the business scale, I think you guys probably saw a great push. It, you know, customers and more and more customers coming your way because that urge and need to be in e-commerce or at least scale that up. Well, there's been billions of dollars that have been shifted from offline retail to online retail. And Shibana was started as a direct consumer platform. And uh, on top of that, just to add a little flavor of Amazon into it, as FBA has been putting restrictions on a lot of brands and merchants, especially during COVID and even right now during the fourth quarter, they needed a new strategy and they needed Stubana to help them execute on their fulfilled by merchant strategy. And we allow them to get that set up in no time. So, what to the sellers or to Amazon or both? Well, they can connect to Amazon in, real quick. And then they can also connect to their warehouses or create their own warehouse in Stubana and literally run uh, a technology like Stubana for a fraction of the cost of like an enterprise software that'll give you the same kind of experience like Amazon, hitting Amazon shipping benchmarks without like paying through the nose for it. And what about SFP? You guys uh, were able to yeah, of course. Uh, facilitate SFP, SFP for, your, uh, for your leading uh, client? Of course, we support SFP, uh, merchant uh, multi-channel fulfillment, which is shipping from Amazon FBA off channel to your customer, Great. both FBM, FBA, and drop shipping and 3PL integrations, all of that simultaneously, all in one platform, all in the cloud, which was yeah. unheard of back in the day. Yeah, this is a lifesaver. You know, if, uh, yeah, if, you, if you had the clients uh, have this opportunity, ability to get all these great components, SFP, which is a self-fulfilled prime, uh, you really have to have the matrix, you know, it's really rigid. If you guys facilitate that, that it's great. Um, and from Amazon to uh, uh, other marketplaces, let's say you sold on your website or on eBay and Amazon ships it out, you guys facilitate that, help with all the tracking and, and the revenue. And I would assume also the profit and loss and, and reporting. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's great. And so 2020, you find yourself, although with all the physical challenges of COVID uh, at a growth momentum, mm -hmm. try to say? We, we, yeah, we've been a beneficiary of COVID. It's really painful to, to say that because of the circumstance and the backdrop of what's happening in the country. Right. But we've definitely benefited because of the shift uh, in our space. Got it. Okay. Very good. And uh, how about the retail end? Uh, you know, more consumers were buying uh, coffee filters and, uh, you know, uh, vacuum cleaning filters. You're still in the vacuum yeah, uh, I mean, business? People or? Are people, yeah, we're still in that business, still in the entire home appliance parts business. And again, due to COVID, actually a funny thing. So we started noticing a lot of people were buying our HEPA bags. 
And I had no idea what why. What type of bag? Sorry for my. The type uh... of bag is a high efficiency particulate arrest vacuum bag that uh, essentially is made of the same stuff that KN95 masks are made of for face coverings. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. And we started noticing people were buying these bags, and I had no idea why. So I'm taking a shower one but day. But when did you see the uptick? Well, January uh, or February? It was, it, no, it was March. It was like mid-March, March 18th or something. I had this epiphany in the shower. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that's most, most epiphanies, right? It happened in the shower. Uh, do you so, sing though? Do you sing or no? What? I just sing, I'm sing? not a singer in the shower. I just sit okay. there and I like brush my teeth aimlessly and I get into like this like zone that I can't get out of. And I'm like, my mind is spinning and I'm like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. Our vacuum bags are the same thing that's made of KN95 masks. And there's a shortage in Rockland County, which is where I live, in the hospitals where they need PPE protection. This is before everyone got on the PPP wave. Wow, okay. PPE wave. So I made a donation nice. to the hospital, to the frontline workers of a massive quantity of these bags. So you and had it in stock available in the area? In stock, in New Jersey, in the area. Made a donation. Nice of you. Super thankful. Like the head, of, the head of director of the hospital had reached out, but on top of that, it actually hit the news. Oh. So, somebody that was super early on in this PPE making mask, they changed their entire factory from making aprons to making masks. The company's called Headley and Bennett. We formed a partnership where they make the mask and we sell the filter media that goes in the mask because they have a pocket for the media. And uh, it was a win-win for both companies. So, so essentially, you became a supplier to them. They were guiding people to go to our website. Now, if I was never off of Amazon, or if I was never multi-channel, or didn't hadn't hadn't invested, and had the foresight of investing into our own brand, into our own website, this would have never come about, right? In fact, it would have never come about if I hadn't made a donation. Right? So I'm hold on, let me get the context. So you did a donation that opened up uh, t media attention, and then the opportunity presented itself because of that media attention. Well, it was a combination of media attention. An employee at Stubana saw what was happening. We had somehow had conversations with Headley and Bennett in the past at Stubana. We did a dinner together. And then one thing led to another. We formed a joint venture partnership. Beautiful. Brilliant. Unbelievable. And we've, uh, I mean, it's been a fruitful relationship. And uh, we are now, we're now in our third wave we used to just sell the vacuum bags and people were cutting it themselves mm -hmm. and people didn't want to cut themselves. They wanted it to be pre-cut. So then we hired a factory in the United States to make some, to do some cutting for us. Now we're officially making a whole phase three design of the product, which is the packaging and everything pre pre made and enclosed uh, for our, our customer base. Got it. And how do you find yourself managing, I guess, at this point, all these uh, activities? I mean, how's your day look like? Yeah, share with us a little bit. And I know, congratulations, you had a, you know, uh, you know, a baby born recently. So congratulations yeah, 15 for that. Month, 15, 15 year old, uh, 15, 15 year old, I wish, <laughs> 15 month old. <laughs> um, and that has been a shift in priorities for me and a shift in identity. Cause I always was ad identifying being an entrepreneur for me. It was like, that was it, right? My group of friends are entrepreneurs and everything revolved around that. And now I'm, I've shifted into being a father. So, uh, so how do you balance all that, right? Yeah, so routine. I think it comes down to literally habits and routine. Mm -hmm. And I don't go on, I used to go on Instagram a little more. I found myself not feeling good about Instagram or Facebook. I watched Social social Dilemma. Uh, and so I'm in a routine, right? I wake up early. I spend that time with my, my son. We have breakfast together every morning. Right. Uh, we play, we walk, we crawl, we climb, we read. And then I get into my day. Uh, and I go straight through back to back and I try to be as efficient with my time as possible and making sure that I say no uh, to, as, to as many activities that aren't going to be high impact to any of the things that I'm pursuing. Yeah, so I'll take it as a compliment. Thank you for, uh, I guess, uh, taking the time today to do uh, this. Well, so, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for you having me on. So sure, our pleasure. It's a real privilege. Okay, so so I think I take it as a big lesson. So how do you identify the things that is going to be less impactful? You can say, no, thank you, or let's do this later on, and then you prioritize. And you have a team that helps you with that, or is it just you, you pop into your emails, and right away you know what to say no to? What's the uh, dynamics there? So we have some canned responses in email for no. Uh, and then I take a look at my calendar to see like what's happening on the weekly basis to see where can I optimize my time. Uh, there's things that I love doing. There's things that I hate doing. There's things I hate doing, but I need to do. You have to do, yeah. Uh, and there's things that I love doing that I 
never have time to do. And so finding a nice balance and a, a lot of that comes down to process and speaking up, right? Being candid with the team saying like, hey, like I don't need to maybe go on like 20 million webinars this quarter. Let's pick and choose the webinars that are gonna be the most high impact for the company and prioritize those. So establishing a criteria around that, and by the way, it's criteria around my entire life, right? And so what are things that I should be doing that I'm not doing? What are the things that I'm doing that I hate doing? And being able to categorize and classify those items in a way that's meaningful and supports uh, and honors where I want to be in life. You got it. And you think you do you did you try to trickle this into your organizations, or is this something you take on your own? And you know you don't try to impose uh, on any other. What's kind of the dynamics there inside the organization? Because yeah, they're all I, remote, but you have to somehow distill that. Yeah, I mean, I, you've got Gina joining. I see her. Uh, I see her here. And with Gina, I'm. I'm. She's so talented on the marketing team that uh, I'm always thinking like, how can we leverage her more? Right. And mm -hmm. what are the things that she's doing that's eating up her time that we could be using and going like spear fishing, finding somebody that does that task, does it really well and could alleviate you so you can make the biggest impact on the company. And uh, we're doing that cross department. Right. So I think this is cross pollinating. I think this goes back to actually when you're building a company, it's a largely a reflection of who you are. Uh, the systems that you have in place and the people that you have in place and who you're hiring uh, and, and, and firing and who you're bringing into the family is a large part of, of the success of the, of, in the DNA of the company itself. 100%. And how, how does DJ fit into all everything right now? Where is he located at this point? Well, DJ actually, so he's moved from New York to Georgia. Nice. That's where so where he is he originally was, from? That's where he's so, from? Yeah, Georgia. Uh, what about? Where about? I, I believe he, he's living in Atlanta now. Got it. And he actually is just coming off of a three week, I think it was a three week, maybe it was longer. He took a, uh, he's always had a bucket list item to go cross country. So he went roof camping with his car cross country uh, and is now actually just arrived back into Atlanta last night. Nice. Did he happen to go to Emory or no? Uh, he didn't go to Emory. No, he went, I think he went to a state school in Georgia. Got it. And he grew up in Atlanta also or some, somewhere in that grew area? Grew up in Atlanta, yeah. But he's originally a Croatian. Oh, got it. So he was born and raised in Croatia? He was definitely born and raised there. And then he moved over to the United States, I think, in his early teens. Got it. Got it. All right. So, yeah, I connected what you said with, uh, I guess, the organization is a reflect, you know, reflection of you, hopefully the positive things of you. You take the best things that you have to offer, the best values, you know, and work on the ones that you can do some Wait, more work. I, I do want to say, just to add, right, a yeah. comment to that is like, it also has the worst things too, right? And it's, it's important. And that's why if you're hiring the right people at the company, they can, you want to hire somebody that you admire that can elevate and raise the game of your current team or department or company. And I think that, so, so it's not a reflection of all your, all your uh, fallacies or your flaws. Yeah. So once again, you try to distill the good, share that along, but recognize the ones you have weaknesses and make sure those weaknesses are not, you know, underneath you with the team as it trickles down and they have those strengths. And then all together, it just, you know, everybody raises together and, and the whole value proposition for customers, you know, uh, the, the solution that you guys are creating, the experience that you guys are creating, it's all so positive, it's so enriched and it takes a real team effort. Nobody, it's no one person that can create that. It's an ecosystem that you create that every touch point, it gets, you know, it, you know, yeah consumers, whoever is the user is, uh, gets that experience. And hopefully that makes you thrive for, for long-term and create the uh, long-term success. All right, beautiful. Uh, Chad, um, you know, it's gr great so far. I mean, your story, uh, thank you so much for sh sharing it. I had a, you know, a, a, an amazing experience uh, running all around. It seems like you were able at some point, I'm not sure exactly when, but to move from the city to Nyack. I live in Nyack now. Yeah, I live in Nyack. Yep. W what was that trigger there? When did you moved before the pandemic, right? Yeah, we moved here. We have been here for five years. And I just wanted uh, more space, countryside, hiking, fresh air. That's great. That's great. So sharing, you know, thank you uh, for sharing this story so far. So we're going to, you know, put, put things to a close. So um, essentially, there's going to be two things we're going to close with. The first thing is if, you know, people are looking uh, to reach out to you or to Scubana or for, to get some filters, where can they find you guys? Um, and the second thing will be um, what is going to be your uh, message of hope and, inspirations, uh, for, and, and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? All right. So... The first one would be to find me. My personal email address is chat at scubana.com. If you're in the market for technology to automate and run your business, of course, check us out or send me an email. Happy to help you in your, in your journey. 
Uh, also, if you need filters, you can just check out thinkcrucial.com. Uh, if you're interested in, in more of my story, you can check out the book, Cheaper, Easier, Direct. The course is found on Amazon. And in terms of inspiration, uh, I, I, you know, that's a lot, just, but you know, let's wrap it up. Uh, you know, uh, whatever's on your mind, let's freestyle it. Uh, I think that look, there's always an opportunity. I think there's opportunities everywhere, right? And a lot of those opportunities could be resource distractions. And especially if you're doing things under the auspice of making money, if you're truly passionate and, and your work becomes a, a, essentially you're integrating your work into your life where it becomes an extension of you and, you're, and it becomes your hobby, uh, I think that's really powerful because when other people see me working, they think I'm working, but I'm actually, I'm actually having fun. I'm doing my hobby. And so I think you should really think with that mindset of, okay, I don't want to do this for money. This is actually something that I'm super into that I can dedicate my life to. So for me, I've kept very focused on e-commerce specifically for a good reason. I'm pay playing long-term games with long-term people that are in my community, that are in my network and opportunities come up all the time outside of that. And I really just want to double down in that. So if I can encourage other people right now, go after what you're passionate about and what you know about, double down on that. And I promise uh, if you're making other people happy in the process, you're going to have a positive outcome for you and your family. 100% agreed. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. know, Chad, once again, thank you so much for taking the time, sharing your story. I found it fascinating. I wish we had more time. Maybe we can do this, uh, you know, a, a sequel at some point. But until then, I wish you, uh, I wish you a much uh, more a tremendous success uh, for you and the whole Scubana team and the Think Crucial team. And, uh, you know, stay safe and healthy over there in Nyack, not too far from me. Hopefully we'll meet once the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, goes down a little bit. But uh, you know, I, I also want to just express gratitude for walking me through uh, memory lane and almost uh, allowing me to relive the adventure that I very rarely reflect on because I'm so focused on the future. There you go. Looking into the past, I, I do believe it uh, creates some sort of ventilation and uh, it's, uh, it's, it empowers the self and into the future as well. So hopefully you can take that energy forward. Thank you again, everybody, for joining with us today. Stay safe and healthy. Until next time. Thanks, Yoni. All right, so the live uh, is, is off of Facebook. I'm going to shut the recording down.